Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the session. Great to have you here. Um, so today we have in the first inaugural fireside chat for this SIG on digital disruption and digital transformation. We are pleased to have you here. And perhaps more, impo more importantly, we are pleased to have one of the big icons in this area to be our guest for today, and that no other than Christopher Tucci from Imperial College. Chris, we're very happy to have you here today. Well, thank you very, <laughs> thank you very kindly for the invitation. I, I, I really appreciate it. <laughs> it, it. It is a pleasure, really, to have you here. I mean, um, so as we started this, a lot of my colleagues were already talking about how you've made an impact on their research and the different things that they do right now, and that speaks to the value of having you. Um, here today. And the topic we're about to talk about today really is we pretty much bringing the essence of the name of the SIG to the table here, digital disruption and digital transformation. So um, what I would like to ask those that are joining us to do before we begin would be to, um, let's do a quick poll. Um, if you could just go to menti.com on your phone um, or your, your tablet or laptop, and use the code you see on the screen right now. I'll very much appreciate that. Um, so while that's going on, um, Chris, perhaps we could just begin um, digital disruption and digital transformation. These are terms that we hear all around these days. What do they mean to you? How do you, um, what's your opinion on them? <laughs> okay, well, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I... Let me just start by saying, I think that, you know, that people overuse the word, you know, disruption quite a bit. Um, and typically people mean to, they, I think that the common usage of it right now is just to say something like, you know, it's something that changed a little bit <laughs> uh, because of some digital services. Um, something that changed some of the offers out, out there. And in some case, it may have caused some kind of, um, let's just say, industrial um, in, incumbent, let's just say incumbent uh, reaction. And, you know, that's a, that's a very loose way of saying, you know, that's just a way of saying, oh, we think that the digital enabled us to have some new product or service that's out there. And maybe some incumbent that was out there, you know, got caught off guard a little bit. Um, but on the other hand, I feel like that's, that's a very like, <laughs> you know, that could, that could just be for anything. You know, people say, we're going to disrupt this. We're going to disrupt that. So what, you know, what does it really mean? I think, you know, when people talk about disruption, then you're, you're typically talking about something that really overturning industrial structure or something like this. You know, I think going back to Schumpeter uh, and thinking about creative destruction from technological change, I think this is what you know, I think that's a much higher bar. Let's put it that way. So, right. you know, something that comes out that because of some digital uh, infrastructure that whoever introduces it to market has, um, and then that that enables them to either have like a much lower cost structure than all the incumbents, you know, so even putting, so even the price of new products and services, you know, based on this digital platform or digital technology infrastructure is even below the cost of the incumbents or something like that. So then you're, you would expect to see like widespread, you know, failures of incumbents. And, and that's what I think is like the bar, like that's a, that's a much higher bar. I think saying, oh, we're going to disrupt the dog food industry because we're going to be the Uber of dog food or something like this, which people say, you know, right. yeah. <laughs> you know it's, like, it's kind of an exaggerate. It's a little exaggeration, just meaning they be, mean it to mean they're going to be very successful with the digital. Um, so that's the digital disruption part. So it ranges from everything from, hey, you know, we're going to have a new dog food delivery service based on digital technologies, you know, okay, right. to, you know, we're going to introduce a completely different way of feeding dogs or something like this, which is going to, you know, change all of the, all the places around that sell dog food and, and they're all going to go out of business, you know, <laughs> and everything right. in between. Right. Um, th then in terms of the digital transformation part, I mean, Digital transformation, I usually think of it as being, um, you know, on at an organizational level. So it's, it's trying to change and adopt digital technology. So use digitization, you know, so in other words, just simply making analog things digital. 
and you know, digitalizing them. So in other words, you're, you're taking advantage of them inside you know, your, your organization, whatever kind of organization you have. And then to also have a widespread cultural you know, acceptance and change inside the company and change the way you actually are internally organized as well as your external offer. So I think digital transformation is something that's oriented toward you know, one organization and it basically involves not just knowing about new technologies, not just saying you're gonna adopt new technologies, but actually doing something with them and, and having that be accepted by people you know, in that organization. So that's like a more of a transformational element to it in some sense. Right, so um, actually there's a lot of things you pointed out here. One of them would be the, um, the disruption and that's just overly misused term <laughs> and now you couple it with digital, which is also another overused term, and you not get an explosion. Now, what I see that's happening right now is what I actually call the digital X. Yeah. And what you see here is pretty much things that we've already had with established concepts like transformation, innovation, strategy, now suddenly get a digital attached to them. Yeah. Now, the question that the, this brings to mind is what is really different about digital? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. Um, and I, you know, I started working on this a long time ago with Alan Afua, you know, this is what um, Daniel was saying just before we started today that, you know, that um, he had seen this and, and, and originally back then I started thinking about like, what is different about internet? So in other words, you know, back in the day. And, you know, we came up with a, several different um, categories, let's just say, or over time, we've developed them into different categories. So some, I like to talk about sometimes like the sources of digital value, you know? So is it, is it, is it different from any other technology? You know, is it the, um, you know, any, any kind of technology, you know, the, 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 the horse-drawn carriage versus the, you know, versus the, um, the car? you know, the, the internal combustion engine. So, you know, I think there are some elements of technological change, pure technological change that have nothing to do with whether it's digital or not. But on the other hand, you know, I think that digital um, could be, you know, thought of in different ways. So let me just run these by you a little bit, you know, so I think that um, one category could be like digital uh, technology and your, your operations, you know, I, I consider that to be a relatively big category. So you know, digital technology might be able to um, change the way that you think about timing and structure, for example, you know, new product development teams that can run around, that can run in different time zones and that can easily hand off information. If you didn't have digital technologies, you know, you wouldn't be able to do, to coordinate that work, you know? So in some sense, it's a, it's a, it's a question of, of time. Um, you know, obviously distribution channel. I mean, that's a very, very big one. And I think that's something that's, that that's newer relative to say, you know, a, a car, you know, the, the internal combustion engine. I'm going to refer back to that all the time because I feel like that's a pretty good example of a technological change that was very radical, that had a big impact on the world, but wasn't a digital technology, you know? So if you think about digital delivery of content or something like this, um, you know, that's, that's a pretty big deal. So anything that can be digitized uh, that people could consume could technically be delivered. And even things that can't be consumed can be sold over a digital channel. So I think that's also quite, you know, quite interesting. Um, and then maybe another one in this category. I mean, there are other things, but just the, the top three say, you know, like your the so-called, you know, infinite virtual capacity or something like this. Like the, you know, the the sense of on the consumer side at least that, you know, what you, offering being able to offer like a long tail or something like this. You know, like a long tail, you know, gives you the impression like when you go on. Amazon or whatever, or a bookseller online, you know, you, you're looking at a lot a bigger set of titles than you could get in any brick and mortar store. And to you, it seems like it's, you know, wow, it's like unlimited uh, capacity to handle my personal, you know, needs in some sense. So that'll be category number one. Categ category number two, I would call more like community. So what's different about digital, you know, is it's this idea of, you know, enabling more mediation or enabling more community more easily. I think we, that's, that's pretty obvious to most of us, right? Um, 
uh, that you, people can talk to each other that couldn't talk to each other very readily before, except face to face, or maybe, you know, you think about um, job placements in magazines or something like that. You know, now, boom, you know, <laughs> you know, the matchmaking and things like that are are quite enabled by um, by digital. So I think that's that's quite that's quite good. Also, in terms of everybody having it, everyone having access to certain kinds of digital technologies already. Uh, and having it be a low cost standard. So there's an element of community in there um, that's different now than, than before. And then my final one, um, somebody, uh, this consulting company called Razorfish is a very interesting company. They, they, call it, they said, oh, this is like kind of like the revolution category or something like this, which is you know, something like network externalities. I don't wanna make too big a deal about it um, because I feel like there's a lot of misunderstanding about network externalities. But let's, I mean, I think that probably it is true that digital technologies do um, build or enable or take advantage of network externalities more. So people care about either how many other people use this thing or on the service, or they care about the complementary services associated with this particular service. Uh, you know, they, they want to participate in a platform because there are lots of other people on the other side of the market. So I think that that for sure is, it's a real thing. I, on the other hand, you know, I'm not so convinced that switching costs have gone up. If anything, they've gone down, you know? So I don't think it's necessarily this huge source of competitive advantage, but I do think it's different about digital is that there are more network externalities out there um, right. to like, you know, look, cutting information asymmetries and things like this. So that, that, that's my relatively long winded answer to your question. But I think that, you know, there are some differences between this, ver this, this kind of technology and prior technological revolutions. Indeed, and I think um, I think that actually takes us to the next thing I would like to ask you, which would be the implications for innovation management. But before we do that, um, we've got a question from Erwin. Erwin, could you um, unmute your mic? Yes, Christoph, thank you. Um, you mentioned like you started this work when you look at the internet. So like, yeah, 20 years ago, there was internet business or e-business, electronic commerce. Yes. So we saw a lot of the same ideas like information, communication, distribution, transportation. Exactly. So I've been always wondering, are, are the core ideas the same, but now 20 years later, it's more feasible? Like we have to scale, we have the cloud services, we have the ease of use, ease of use to do these things. While these ideas were still posing a lot of challenges 20 years ago, technologically wise in particular. Now technologically wise, at least it's much easier. Sure. I completely agree with your comment. Um, uh, if if that's if that's your if you want me to react to that, I I think that indeed um, these digital sources of value, you know, were already evident, uh, you know, 20, 25 years ago. However, it hasn't. It's taken a, quite a long time. One because of technological evolution, as you as you discuss. So everything's gotten gotten more powerful and cheaper. And it's also taken a lot of time, a very long time, actually, for companies to adopt these things, you know, um, even if they were out there already. Um, so it's, it's, it's a combination of diffusion and the, you know, technological um, evolution that make them more, I would say, a little bit more powerful now, or maybe a little bit more relevant now than they were back in the, back in the day. Yeah. Interesting. Um, thanks. Thanks, Erwin. So let, let's actually go back to innovation management because a lot of the people we have in the, in, the, in the group right now are actually interested in innovation management. And you've been an innovation um, scholar yourself. So now that we see all, uh, you've talked about the different things that make um, digital stand out, the community, network externalities. But for a manager that's trying to wrap his or head around this digital, what do you think are the implications of all that you said now for innovation management? Okay, well, um, that's an excellent question. Uh, I think that, first of all, let's just review. I mean, let's just think about it from the point of view. What's the goal, you know, mm, of, right. of innovation management function? So to people who work in innovation management typically think of themselves as, you know, trying to work on future proofing, you know? They're thinking not about tomorrow. They're thinking about, you know, a little bit longer term down the road in, in some cases, you know, five years, 10 years down the road. And so I think there, the idea is, you know, they're looking to identify new technologies, you know, new products and services 
and new business models, products, processes, and services, let's just say, and new business models that's going to be, you know, that'll, that'll be useful, you know, at some point um, in the future. So, you know, um, so there are many little angles on this. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know how it's going to transpire. We don't know there's going to be progress in one area versus another area. You know, so um, some of the some of the work. So these the implications for this is it could it could change the, the innovation management function itself. You know, that's that's one thing. And then it could also change the kinds of things that that managers are looking at inside their own organization. So let's let's take these two things um, one at right. a time. Okay, so this is the, I, I wrote a paper at last year, um, you know, with, um, with John Vito Lanzola and Danilo Pesce. And we were actually thinking about, you know, the digit, digitalization and digital transformation and how it might actually influence um, the innovation function, you know? And so in, that, in there, what we were trying to say is, you know, imagine that you have di these digital technologies and imagine that you are uh, able to take full advantage of them and how might your, your digital, your innovation actually change the process of working in your company? You know, so one thing might be, you know, you might actually use it to be go to go more deeply. Like you might, you may actually use digital tools and 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 techniques and methods to go more deeply. Uh, so you basically become, you know, more narrow, but you go deep. And another idea might be that you could actually use digital technologies to overturn your, your existing knowledge structures to sort of break out of your knowledge routines and actually open up to a broader set of knowledge uh, that you can take advantage of inside your own organization. So that was one element that we were thinking. And then we were also thinking about um, uh, how, digital, how your digital skills might change in terms of the balance. Like, does it reinforce your competencies you know, inside your company? Or does it, you know, sort of um, complement uh, what's in your company or replace what you're doing in your company? So your knowledge about what, you know, what you're working on and what your company does, et cetera. And so, you know, the digital transformation could actually, it's hard to know, could go either way. And so those kinds of things are going to lead you to different ways of thinking about how to come up with new products um, and services. Uh, because if you, if you can, if you, if you need to uh, replace your skill set with more digital skills, even in your innovation management area, you know that that there's a delicate balance there because you don't want to completely say, "Oh, I'm going to hire a bunch of data scientists and that's going to and I'm going to fire everybody who's working in innovation management." That doesn't sound like a very smart. I mean, most of us would would laugh at that suggestion, you know. Uh, but a lot of companies say, "Oh, you know, maybe we need to just you know bring on board you know all of these digital skills and and everything will take care of itself because we're going to be more data driven or something like <laughs> or something like this, you know. And I think that might be a little bit of an overkill. In certain circumstances, you might be you might benefit from having more digital skills in your innovation management group and in your, in your operations as well. Uh, but in most cases, I doubt that it's gonna require completely replacing everybody, uh, which some people say. So that's one angle on this. The other angle on it is sort of to say, you know, how, how, do, we, how do we run these things? How do we actually test things and get started as, as you mentioned, you mentioned getting started. So, you know, um, I think that the, probably the best um, approach here is to run a lot of small experiments. So if you're in a company that's, I mean, of course, if you're a startup company, you, you know, you're doing your thing and you're pivoting and you're, you're trying new things. Now, the, that's not so bad. The, the hard part is if you're in a larger organization and you already have a lot of resources out there and you have a lot of, you know, for, for good reasons, you have bureaucracy inside your own company. And the question is, you know, how do you introduce these things without disrupting so-called um, <laughs> everything else going? So, so, you know, one of the things is, this is another little um, paper that Henry Chesbro and I were working on, I published it last year on, on lean startup approaches for, you know, um, open innovation. And, and I think that it applies really, really well to some of these digital technologies, because basically, what we're arguing is that you know you kind of need to run these little experiments and these are going to be like little business model experiments and then at some point um you, you know you're going to some of them are going to work and some of them aren't going to work maybe there's technological um problems 
and maybe there are um, customer acceptance problems, you know, so the market isn't there that you thought it was going to be there, or maybe it just doesn't work the way you thought it was going to work, you know, in your context. So there's lots of different reasons why it might not work. And so that's why, you know, you don't want to sink a lot of money into these things, which is why people say that's not very lean. You know, it's not very lean to, to, to sink a lot of money into something <laughs> uh, and then send it, you know, commercialize it and then have nobody want it. So in this sense, you know, running a bunch of a bunch of small pilots and then seeing what works and then trying to like treat them like little lean startups somehow um, and think about them as learning opportunities oh. and then it, scale them up if, the, if it takes off. So I think that's kind of like an approach that I, you know, that I, I think is a useful one for a bigger organization that says, you know, um, maybe in the past you did a central R&D. And now maybe you want to think about moving a little bit, shifting more toward corporate new venture group, running these small pilots and running these little experiments that you may not have done in the past. Right. So if, if I may jump, you know, kind of push back a bit here, Chris. Um, yeah, sure. So listening to your presentation about digital within innovation management, I get a very positive picture. <laughs> but if I take a step back and take a more critical stance, I'd say it's not all roses, wouldn't you agree? So thinking about what? It, it's not all roses, so it's not all positive to the innovation managers. Yeah, um, I mean, it just depends. I, I feel like it's a new opportunity, you know? It's so, so in the sense, um, from the point of view of innovation management type thinking, I mean, I'm not saying it's all a bed of roses for everybody. And I think that in general, that's there was a great article, who is it? The, Tabrizi, I think, wrote a really good article in, in Harvard Business Review about digital transformation. And mm -hmm. I think that, that there was mo the most ex uh, insightful piece of that was to say, you need to attack employees' fears of redundancy. You have to mm. address it head on. Right. Otherwise, it won't work. Right, right. <laughs> you know? Indeed. And, Indeed. <laughs> yeah. So, so I think that, you know, I'm not saying that it's um, all good all the time. Uh, and I think that, but in general, you know, having an extra tool in your tool set is probably good. Now, you know, you might say, well, we're going to become more efficient in the end. We're going to, we're going to digitalize, you know, all of our business processes and we're going to be much more efficient. Now we don't need 50 accountants or whatever to keep track of everybody's receipts because we're going to scan all the receipts and we're going to just put it against some algorithm and decide whether, you know, we just pay people immediately if they're within some kind of limits. And then we have, we can leave a few people around to go and check the ones that are a little bit out of norm, you know? Right. So then you have this, this fear of, you know, hey, we're going to have to downsize or something like this. I, I think that's a fantastic point. I think that's one of the fears on the mind of innovation managers because the technologies are there, they, those boxes are there, but they're the humans you've got to deal with. And I think that's a fantastic point. But I still like to pull and um, push further on that point. But before we yeah. move on, Elaine, you've got a question for us. Elaine? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, Thank you for this uh, conversation, interesting conversation. So I'm uh, just back to the, the, the open innovation and uh, some thoughts about uh, the digital business ecosystem uh, of innovation. What are your thoughts about uh, the chains and relationship if, with the partners and uh, all the the dynamic around the uh, innovation in business and digital business ecosystem. Yeah, do you mean more like a platform type business or do you mean, you know? Any yeah, it's included platforms, yes. Yeah, but I, I it's agree. not the only way that a digital business uh, ecosystem uh, works. So uh, I'm curious about uh, what your thoughts well, about this. Okay, I actually have lots of rant. I have lots of views about this, but you know, about the platform. Let's thing. go. <laughs> hey, let's go. I mean, the thing is, um, okay, about the platforms, I'm not convinced that, you know, we need to have a platform for every single thing. I already mentioned about being the Uber of dog food, um, you know, the Uber of street lights, the Uber of, you know, garage doors. I don't know. <laughs> I think it's, it's, we just like, we've gone crazy on this multi-sided market concept. And I, I don't really think in general that they're that useful. You know, if you think about all the stuff I was talking about before um, in terms of like the different, um, you know, sources of digital value or something like that, you know, 
So let's rev let's just think about all those things I mentioned. I mentioned all these different, things. you know, how many of these things are actually relevant for platforms? You know, I would say probably distribution, you know, digital distribution, um, digital marketing, you know, so for sure there could be some element of operations there, maybe. Um, mediation. So that means, you know, bringing together buyers and sellers or people who want to, you know, communicate with each other. And I think, yeah, there's a, there's a scope for that too, for sure. And that could be part of a larger business ecosystem, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Um, and then finally, you know, you might argue for um, that network externalities could be interesting as a platform provider, um, you know, as assuming that there are switch high switching costs. So, you know, just from that point of view, you know, it, this excluding so many things. And actually, personally, I, I actually get tired of hearing all these entrepreneurship. I, I, I get sick of them, you know, like these projects that are proposed by groups of students or hackathons or wherever. And everyone, every single one has to come up with the platform. I'm going to enable platform. I'm going to have a business of having babysitters in my apartment complex, you know, um, and, and which is fine. It's actually not a bad idea, but it's not really a business idea. You know, it's not a scalable business at all, right? I mean, you're, you're, so um, I feel like we, we're really exaggerating the use of digital technologies for the benefit of platforms. Um, I think that anything that produces a physical product, you know, I doubt it. I, I sincerely doubt it. Pure cost reductions, you know, digital technologies for cost reductions. Like I'm thinking like the drones that are being used in insurance, like that's a digital technology. That's really interesting, so, right? Um, if, if I may jump in, um, okay. Chris. So, so we're talking about digital disruption and digital transformation. The evidence, I mean, there's this book that um, Van Alstyne, I got to speak with him recently, Marshall and his co-authors, they've written this book about platform. And one of the things that they tell us in that book is that the platform business model beats the product business model every single time yeah and i think that sounds like oh that's digital disruption but what i'm hearing right. from you is perhaps a bit of caution yes go ahead Chris. yes yes i completely I, I, exactly right you know and um uh marshall van alstein and jeff parker you know when my phd program with me i love them you know etc um and, and 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 i think it's quite insightful and i actually do have students read chapters from that book but i think you know I'm skeptical a little bit about that it's you know all good all the time. And I think what there was another book recently by Annabelle Gower and Michael Cusumano and David Yaffe, I think, on platform business. And basically in there, they basically make the argument that you know a platform doesn't make a bad business into a good business. <laughs> you know, so I think that in general, I would be a little bit skeptical of saying, oh, we should have a platform for, you know, a platform business for everything. I'm going to make two sides of a market or three sides or five sides, and I'm going to subsidize them and, you know, have them interact with each other. And I'm going to make, you know, make it into a great business now. Right. So that, that's my first part of your okay. of the question. And now the second part of the question is, you know, could it, could it be useful in a larger business ecosystem? Now I'm thinking here of not a platform business where there's a dominant party, but I'm thinking more of a you know, where it's a systemic product where people where groups of companies work together to produce some kind of service to the you know, customers or something like the end users, you know, right. and I think there, you know, there's a really good example where you could have where digital technologies will actually help be very helpful in uh, communication amongst the ecosystem partners, coordination, um, possibly, you know, interfaces between the parties. And I think there it could be, uh, it could help maybe get over this problem that we've had in ecosystems in the past, which is that if someone wants to innovate a part of a, a systemic product, that it's hard to migrate everybody else in the ecosystem along with them if they're not dominating the ecosystem. Right. So I think there's All some right. role there for digital technologies in an overall bigger ecosystem. And I think there's some role in platforms also. I'm not saying there's none. I'm just saying yeah. not everything all the time. That's okay, all. Chris, can you hold on to that thought? I know Mumin has a question for you, but I've got, a, I've got an example I'd like us to um, kind, of, um, kind of talk about Netflix versus Blockbuster. You've talked a lot about Uber, but before we pick up on that, um, Mumin, can we have your question, please? Yes, thanks very much, uh, Biomi. Uh, and thanks very much, uh, Christopher. It's um, been really engaging and insightful. I um, just wanted to just get a bit more about um, your views on 
digital transformation and disruption. Um, prior to the recent, if like rhetoric around digital technology, digital transformation, we had technological innovations, obviously following from Rogers and Shoemaker talking about direction of, of innovations in organizations and in society. And the two concepts come up, obviously, which is the market pool and the technological push. So basically customers determine what they want and obviously the developers of technologies develop those technologies uh, and the reverse obviously technologically pushes uh, developers develop the technology and says, well, if you adopt this technology, you'll be great, you will be efficiency, there will be productivity increased in the organization. And of course, we know some of, sometimes this results to what we call the productivity paradox. So the more you invest in technology, if like um, productivity kind of declines. Yeah. Um, so, 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 so it's a kind of an existing, obviously, um, argument. But now with, with new technology, with open innovation, the fact, obviously, you mentioned the fact that now some 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 companies will decide to employ the innovators themselves. Um, so, does that kind of bridge that gap between the market pool and the technological push, and how does that enhance um, productivity? Does it kind of allow us to overcome this productivity paradox that we, obviously that we know? Yeah, I, I, that's a that's a comp, that's a very interesting question and comp, complex too, because you know there's, these things are all interrelated with each other, and productivity paradox, you know, it it, it it could be partially because you have to kind of keep running to stay in place, you know? So part of this could be adoption of digital tech. In my opinion, um, you know, you have your first part of it, which could be about efficiency. So, you know, I, yes, I, I think it's actually fairly rare that you can do a technology push on the market. Okay. So I think I want to just draw a distinction here between technology adoption that make you more efficient and technology push, you know, onto a market of unsuspecting consumers. <laughs> okay. So for the, for this efficiency part, you know, I think this is actually a very, very smart move. And this may be part of the part of the productivity paradox, you know, that you mentioned here. So, you know, you're going to, you, you have to adopt some of these sooner or later, right? Um, it's like the first, company to adopt a spreadsheet, you know, a, a, a computer spreadsheet, you know, must have had an amazing uh, competitive advantage for a little while. <laughs> but then sooner or later, you know, everyone has a spreadsheet. You now everyone uses Excel now. And so it's, you know, it's, 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 you know, you wouldn't expect to have major productivity jumps after the wave of adoption. But on the other hand, you know, everybody's on the same ground as you. And so the ones who don't adopt the spreadsheets are actually gone because they just can't keep up, you know? So it's, I think it's a similar idea here. Then, I would, I would draw a distinction between that and this idea of, okay, now I have new products and services based on my technology. I don't care what the market wants. I mean, it might work. It has worked in some cases. You know, you think about secret skunk works and things like this. So I'm not saying it never works, but I would say that in general, you know, over and over again, people have shown, you know, the more you do market pull on your end use products, you know, in, on average, you're more successful. <laughs> so, you know, to say that you can take these technologies, you can take, you know, you can do digital, um, digitally enable, enabled service innovation or something like that, you know, come up with new ideas, go talk to people, show them, figure out what people want, feedback, and do it over and over again. So that you end up taking a digital technology and bringing it to market with something that somebody wants. And I think that's the, the link between these things. So you're, you're not trying to do the tech push Maybe I'm not saying you should never do it. If you had, a, if I had a vast portfolio of R and D, I probably do want to have some small things like, hey, think of something that no one even knows they want yet, and just give it to them. You know, fine. <laughs> but for the bread and butter, for the most of it, you yeah. know, I would be, I would be a little bit more oriented toward the market pull after I've already set up my own infrastructure. So I think that's my reaction to your. So Chris, I, I also have a reaction to your reaction, if I may. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm going to share a slide. So this is a slide from a colleague at MIT, Gina Ross. They actually wrote a book called Design for Digital. And a lot of what you're saying resonates with this image that they've got here. But the argument here is that, so you could actually create an offering based on just technology on its own. That's a digitally inspired solution. And right. that's what you call a technology push, which you don't seem to be a fan of. 
And then there's a part where what you create is actually based on customer desires. But what they call the sweet spot is where there can be an overlap between the customer desires, what you call the market, you going to the market and speaking to people versus what the technology is able to do. What's your reaction to this? I think it's it's very nice. I I I, I only my only um, thing is I wouldn't say I'm not a fan of tech push. I just don't think on average it works. I, I, right, I think that right. I think that it does work sometimes. And if it were me, I would also make an investment in tech push myself, a small one. Right. I, I wouldn't bet my whole company on it. That's all. You know. But so Steve I think that's Jobs a very did nice that, right? Thing. Yeah, Apple did that. I was gonna say, yeah, Steve, Steve Jobs did that. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. It, it it's not like it never works. It's just, you're right. You're it's right. rare, and on average, it's hard to, right. hard to bet everything on it. That's all. That that's okay. my reaction. But um, I think that Gene Ross is also a very insightful thinker. By the way, I think she's she is. Good. She is. I think we're already having a list of next people to consider inviting to the next panel series. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I, right. Don't, I don't. I don't want to lose Erin. Erin asked a question about the inter. Um, he started with the internet um, previously. So let's see. I think he has a follow up to Erin. Your turn. Yeah, um, actually we moved a bit on, but you just let it drop me then as a comment when we were discussing the platforms. Um, so yes, I think we sometimes fo overly focus on the few very successful platforms and ignore the, the thousands or millions of failures. And uh, one area that I've studied and where you see lots of failures and little success and millions of investments is for example, the B2B industrial side. So like Siemens, Bosch, GA, Again, 20, 30 years ago, they tried to introduce electronic marketplaces, billions of dollars spent or failed. Now again, they tried to introduce platforms with AI analytics and all fancy stuff for smart machines. And again, nobody can pull it off because technology is much more complicated than consumer products. Yeah. Markets is, are much more complicated than consumer products. So that's, that's an example where, yes, there's so much going on that, that platforms, they may someday give some services in some part of the market, but yeah, it's, it's, it's way more complicated than an Uber or a app phone. I would agree. I would agree. Chris, do you want to react to that or do you? Um, I, yes, I, I'm 100% with you on that. I and think that B2B business is also very tricky. It's not to say that there are no B2B marketplaces because there are. It's just that I don't, I don't see that as like the real growth, you know, like that's like a really, there's just, I don't know. It's just, there's a lot of competition. There are no switching costs. It's just, it's, it's, it's a good idea, but it's just, I don't see it as like a very, very strong business model. Let's put it that way. Right. All right, Chris. Um, so how about we kind of put the spotlight back on you and um, what you're doing right now in, in this space? Because you've done a lot in the innovation space. Now I know you're heading the digital transformation group in Imperial College. Now, because yeah. we've got both scholars and students and practitioners here. So what are the next frontiers when it comes to this topic? Um, what are you looking at and what sure. are the things you are seeing? Okay. Oh, thanks. Um, you know, I've been working, I've launching a new center called Center for Digital Transformation. And we just had our first meeting this morning, actually, our first team meeting um, uh, just this morning. So it's a little bit fresh in my mind. And um you know, we're trying to uh, help understand the organizational implications of digital revolution. So that's the, you know, like the overall goal, thinking about, um, you know, business, government, and society, the implications for all kinds of different organizations. And um, you, we're, what we're doing is we're coordinating a little bit some of the teaching offering here in digital topics at Imperial College, which I think has been very, you know, very exciting. And we're also trying to set up these different kinds of research streams. And I can tell you a little bit about them. So one of them um, is going to be on ethical uses of artificial intelligence. And, and that's you know both from the point of view of, um, let's just say product development or AI as a, as a tool for, you know, for use in society, uh, but also you know, implications for future of work and I already mentioned about the, you know, uh, potential for, uh, you, you know, wholesale unemployment in certain sectors, which, you know, which is well documented at this point, you know, people thinking that in the medium term, probably financial services are the most vulnerable uh, for because of people working and um, doing repetitive tasks. 
uh, that could be automated. And in the, in the longer term, transportation, probably trucking, hauling, uh, would be you know quite vulnerable because of all the, the drivers could be replaced by you know autonomous vehicles or something like this. So, you know I think there's some a lot of interesting work that could be done there. Uh, and thinking about those um, those kind of what to do and how to retrain or reskill uh, some of these people or what are some of the needs of skills of the future. So I've been working on that in terms of financial services. I've been doing some work. Um, also with uh, Gian Vito Lanzola, uh, Simone Santini, and, and we've been thinking about um, ad adoption of AI in financials, and, and actually Margarita Pagani, actually, to be honest, and we've been thinking about the adoption of AI and digital technologies in the financial services sector. So we've been trying to like comb through, you know, statements and websites and information about companies and trying to understand what they're saying, what's reflected in the press, what's reflected in you know, um, the people who follow the companies professionally. Um, so basically, uh, we've tried to a little bit understand the diffusion of digital tech, digital technologies in financial services. I think it's a quite interesting topic because there's quite a long ways to go, but I feel like in the next few years, it's, it's going to be a, a very, very um, important uh, development because of FinTech companies that aren't constrained by necessarily the legacy systems and they're coming on board with more and more products and services. So that's that's one element. Another another thing that I've been working on lately has been what we're, what we're calling digital assets, and you know thinking about blockchain and um, uh, the uses of cri in crypto, but also non crypto. You know, and I, I actually just taught a new class. I just developed a new class called um, blockchain management, which was going beyond crypto and thinking of all the different ways that's being used. And so studying that a little bit. Um, thinking about supply chain management, which is a very, very, very important, I feel, uh, use case, probably maybe the most important use case right now for blockchain technologies. And so I was, I've actually been working on a paper with one of my, with one of Ralph Zeifert's PhD students. I happen to be on her committee and she and I worked together on a paper on thinking about using blockchain versus a traditional database system for a supply chain. You know, what are some of the conditions under which you might consider adopting some kind of blockchain technology? Right. So, you know, doing things like that. And then, of course, I'm still interested in crowds and crowd driven innovation and things like this. Right. And, um, so, so couple, yeah. So just one last thing is I'm trying to think of this is, you know, this idea of low code and no code AI type things. I think it's quite an interesting topic because inside a company, you know, they may not have this, the, the, the ability to actually take on these new projects or to do to implement some AI systems, but they actually might be able to train people in the company to actually and reskill them to do work, uh, and then incorporate their solutions into the company's into the company's products and services. So right, I think there's right. a little that's a little smattering of some of the stuff I've been I've right. Been so from what I can hear, I, I think I can see elements of digital destruction and digital transformation. Because if I if we take an organization as a unit. There are things that are happening outside the organization that may actually impact the organization. And therein lies the potential for digital disruption. That's right. But there are also things within the organization, the things they do with digital technology, the opportunities they try to get, um, that leads more to the area of digital transformation. So I think um, you kind of give a lot for people to actually think about. We're running out of time here, Chris. So I'd like to give this last minute to you. Um, yeah. What would be your concluding statements um, on all we've talked about here today? <laughs> okay, well, thanks. <laughs> um, concluding. Okay, um, I, I would just say that in general, um, I'm quite, um, I think that there's a, a role for this sort of digital transformation in, in a way of working at, at the beginning on the infrastructure, then on the efficiency, and then on new products and services and business models. And I think that's actually, you know, my, what I would recommend in terms of your, you know, a company or any organization's approach to it, rather than trying to immediately come up with new products and services, because then you, you might not have the ability to deliver those things, even if you conceive of them. And it's better to learn a little bit. And I can actually just give you my own personal, and just, I mean, it's not, it's not that, not that important or interesting of a case, but just to say that, you know, people asked me 50, 10 years ago, why are you making a MOOC? You know, MOOCs are ridiculous. MOOCs are useless. No one completes them. 
uh, et cetera. And I said, I'm not making a MOOC to make a MOOC. I'm making a MOOC because I want to learn about digital delivery. So when the next thing comes beside, beyond MOOCs that I'm ready to, to change, you know? <laughs> and I think this is a <laughs> kind of a mentality that it's, a, it's, it's actually good to have as an innovation manager too, if you don't want to be, you know, replaced by a computer. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. Um, all right, Chris, it's been a delight having you here today. We really, really appreciate the insights that you brought to the table, and we hope we get to see you and have you more actively in this SIG going forward in the future. Yeah.